One of the things I've always appreciated about the events organized by Cambridge Ukrainian Studies, Cambridge Polish Studies, um, is their polyphony, by which I don't just mean different opinions, but um, people coming. It's not just academics talking to academics. Um, it's a well-established tradition that it's, we have journalists, we have people in NGOs, activists, and so on. And this panel embodies that, which is um, educative for all of us and a good thing. So back to universities. Uh, and Professor Andrzej Szeptyski from the University of Warsaw, who will talk about contemporary and future challenges for Polish-Ukrainian relations. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I was asked, or I've proposed, to speak about, uh, as it was said, um, contemporary and future challenges uh, for Polish-Ukrainian relations. Uh, which is, in fact, much easier than to speak about what to do in future to make it better. Uh, it's uh, easier to, to define the problems than to say how to, uh, how to solve them, although it's somehow, uh, somehow related. Um, I would like to mention five of them, uh, starting from more general and maybe more well-known and ending with some more, more local in, in time. Um, First problem, uh, speaking also about Poland and Germany and so on, first problem we have to deal with since 1991 till today and also in future is a very asymmetrical character of Polish-Ukrainian relations. And this is very important to, to keep that in mind. We had different starting points in 1989-1991. Poland as was a formally independent country. Uh, it was a nation state, dependent or not on Soviet Union. Uh, Ukraine was even not officially an independent country, although it was at UN, of course. Uh, it was, a, or it is, a nation state uh, in statu nascendi, which is still in the process of nation building, one way or the other. Um, and this also, of course, influences uh, our position, uh, our positions today. Poland is in EU and NATO, peacefully. Ukraine underwent the revolution of dignity. Now it's in fact in state of war with Russia. Uh, and, uh, well, for several years probably it will uh, remain out of EU, not to speak about NATO. In this context, it is difficult, and that's the main point, to construct a strategic partnership. It is difficult to cooperate closely with somebody else who sits in a different car. France and Germany were able, or have been able, to construct very deep and close relations uh, since the end of the Second World War, because basically they were in the same car. They were within NATO, within European communities, there was the communist Soviet threat, and so on. And only in these conditions, they were able to undergo the process of reconciliation, and so on. We are not, unfortunately, France and Germany. And a very good example is, well, the unfamous Polish or EU uh, visa regime for the Ukrainians, okay? Uh, France and Germany now are able to create common uh, consulates or to represent themselves in different international forums, a German representing the France and uh, vice versa. We pose, we have the visa regime for the, for the Ukrainians. Another thing connected with this asymmetry is that uh, sometimes uh, our Polish experience uh, does not really fit Ukrainian reality. We tend very often to consider, uh, especially we in Poland, uh, Poland is an example for Ukraine. And also Ukrainians do that. Uh, the problem is that sometimes it does work, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, I'm very often, uh, especially now, uh, asked by the Ukrainian journalists how Poles assess the reform of the local government and regional uh, territorial government in Poland. My answer is they don't care. This happened 25 years ago. 
I can tell you maybe how they access, how it works now. But I mean, I was 13 years old when the local uh, territorial governments were created in 1990. So it's, uh, it doesn't make sense to ask such questions. Uh, so Polish transformation experience doesn't work always. Second problem we have, uh, it was already mentioned, is of course history. I would say, uh, and here I agree with my predecessor, that the main problem with history is even not that we have a different vision of history. The problem is that an average Ukrainian and average Pole have a different approach towards the existence of common history. Poles are very much sensitive about Polish-Ukrainian history, while most of the Ukrainians, especially those coming from Central and Eastern Ukraine, they basically don't care about it. Uh, simplifying very much, uh, five years ago, if you would have a meeting between Tusk and Timoshenko, uh, Tusk will speak about Volhynia and Timoshenko will speak about visa regime. And this is the main problem. Of course, this is a little bit changing. Certainly in Poland, there are groups of people who use, uh, or political uh, circles, who use history uh, as an instrument against Ukraine. Uh, in Ukraine, the situation is somehow different. I would say that basically Ukrainians uh, have a problem with their history on their own because they cannot fully agree on, uh, on their historical heroes and so on. They have also problems with history, Ukrainian-Russian problems. And these internal problems and Ukrainian-Russian problems very often um, strike Polish-Ukrainian relations. This was the case of Bandera becoming the hero of Ukraine under Yushchenko. It was not done against Poland, I suppose. But still, it had a huge impact on our bilateral relations. This is the same about this year's law on the recognition of uh, UPA as fighters for independence of Ukraine. Well, they were fighting for independence of Ukraine. I mean, historically, it's a fact. Still, for Poland, this becomes a huge, um, a huge problem. However, as I've said, this may change uh, in future with Ukraine uh, uh, trying to implement a more coherent uh, policy of nation building, uh, policy based strongly on Western Ukrainian experience. Uh, here, Ukraine may come to the same point uh, sometimes as Poland, I mean, using history as a tool also uh, against Poland. Uh, Two or three days ago, uh, I've seen on, uh, on the Fifth Channel uh, a long documentary film on the Vistula action, as an example. Vistula action, which basically is not a, let's say, huge problem for most of you, the Ukrainians living in Ukraine, because they were not affected by that. Now, uh, they will know more about that. Third problem, third challenge we may face, this is crisis. Crisis on both sides, I mean, either in Ukraine or in Poland or in EU. Well, about Ukraine, it is evident. We've seen that under uh, Yushchenko, Poland was very much favorable for Ukraine after the year 2004. And then, as the whole EU, we've entered the period of Ukraine fatigue in 2007, 2008 because after three or four years of the orange team, we've understood that basically nothing changes. And if Poroshenko, Yatsenyuk, and the others uh, do not implement coherent reforms, uh, if there is any kind of third Maidan, uh, uh, this uh, Ukraine uh, um, uh, fatigue may come back to, 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 to Poland. However, and this is also a problem for Poland and for Ukraine, we may be affected by EU weakness. Grexit, Islamic State, immigration, uh, uh, Russia aggressive policy towards whatever, the Baltic states. Each of these elements makes EU and also Poland in a way 
less interested in Ukraine. Well, we cannot, in fact, blame the Italians for being very nervous about the immigration in the Mediterranean. We do not receive here in UK, in Poland, in Ukraine, thousands of people coming uh, illegally each day. The problem is we have to find within EU a balance of interests, a compromise, okay? I mean, we can support Italians about immigration. We don't want really to, to receive their immigrants, hoping they will, um, they will support um, our uh, Ukrainian partners. The problem is that more immigrants come, less uh, Ukraine, um, uh, less Ukraine um, matters. If EU uh, becomes weaker, well, it becomes weaker, it has become weaker uh, these last 10, 10 years, this may potentially lead first to the decrease of EU interest in Ukraine, second for the, to, to the decrease of Ukraine interest in, uh, in EU. You've said that, yeah? In Ukraine, people in the Maidan uh, protesting for Europe. In UK, the Independence Party going, uh, going up. At the moment, some Ukrainians may also understand that EU um, is not anymore what it used to be. And Poland, in this context, uh, uh, would be unable to effectively support Ukraine. Because for Poland, EU membership and EU instruments are the main, if not the only, effective instrument to, to support Ukrainian partners. Because we, as a country, we are too weak, too poor, to act alone without EU, EU support. Fourth point, connected with the previous one, uh, the extremism on the both sides. Well, in Ukraine, potentially, if uh, any more extremist movements come to power, it means end of reforms, if there are any. Potentially anti-Polish historical discourse, also potentially anti-EU discourse, especially related to the implementation of the DCFTA which may not work, which may work, but bring in a short term uh, negative results. But what's more important, I think, especially now, uh, Jaroslav Kritik mentioned it in a, in, in a way, is the problem of the rising extremism in, in Poland. This is the problem of our uh, uh, Paweł Kukis, you might have heard of, who got 20% in the presidential elections, although he has no political program. Um, uh, this is also the problem uh, of our openly pro-Russian, anti-European, anti-Ukrainian um, uh, Janusz Korwin-Mikke, who got some 7%, I suppose, in last um, uh, European uh, elections. In Poland, most of the extremist political forces tend to adopt an anti-Ukrainian rather and a rather pro-Russian uh, uh, discourse. I'm not saying they are all on the Russian payroll, although some people esteem that most of the extremist anti-European movements in Europe are. Moreover, these, let's say, populist extremist movements may also adopt an anti-immigration political discourse. For the moment, we don't have politically in Poland a problem with the Ukrainian immigrants. And it's a huge success. If you look at the immigration experience of some other European countries, although this one day may, may change. And fifth and the last point, uh, pragmatism. Uh, in Poland, when the civic platform came to power in the year 2007, it wanted to become more European to adopt a more European policy than the, its predecessors, so the Kaczynski brothers from Law and Justice. And what this more pragmatic, more European policy meant? It meant a reset with Russia. That didn't, didn't work, really. It meant uh, more um, interest in the economic gains, in the economic uh, policies in the East. It meant less sentimentalism, history, and so on. I'm not very sure uh, this is a real threat now with the war in the East. However, uh, this pragmatism one day may come back. Certainly, and this was already mentioned, we see this pragmatism on the Ukrainian side. 
Poles have an impression with Poroshenko that Poroshenko is not really very interested in, uh, uh, in Poland. Uh, well, uh, the talks in the Normandy format without Poland, that Ukraine is much more interested in Germany, uh, seeing it as a big power, and that Ukraine tends to see Poland as a sort of, forgive me, as a sort of useful idiot. Uh, who will always uh, support uh, Ukraine, um, whatever happens. And of course, Poles are not very happy about uh, this very pragmatic approach uh, towards, um, uh, towards uh, Poland. To sum up, uh, if we have such challenges, uh, what is to be done? or at least uh, some positive remarks at the end. What is to be done or what are the conditions for our uh, strategic partnership for our cooperation? Several Polish experts would say it depends mainly on Ukraine. If Ukraine becomes, uh, is able to reform itself, uh, everything will be perfect. It will become closer to EU, and uh, that's how our relations will improve. Well, of course, it's true, but uh, it's not the only point. I think we need, of course, stable Ukraine, because if Ukraine remains unstable or becomes once again undemocratic, uh, Polish-Ukrainian relations will become um, like, well, Italian-Libyan or French-Tunisian relations. I think we don't need that. You remember Komorowski, uh, in 2012, was the only president together with Yanukovych and uh, Lukashenko, who came to Kyiv for the final of the Euro 2012. I think we don't need such partnership, Komorowski, Yanukovych, and Lukashenko. Okay? So of course we need stable and democratic Ukraine, but we need also a stable uh, Poland, because any political and economic uh, problems in Poland will affect the Polish-Ukrainian project. And we need, finally, a stable and uh, well-functioning EU. Because if EU is weak, uh, it will be unable, with Polish participation, to effectively um, help Ukraine. Thank you.